Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Lowdown. Today I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by the foodie footler, aka Mark Pugh, to discuss his wonderful career today. Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to the chat, mate. Hope you're well. Oh, good here in Dubai. Getting ready for the big move at the moment, as we were discussing off camera, but you're the highlight of my day now, Mark. So <laughs> all attention here. Um, Mark, as we begin with every guest, um, I begin with a simple question earliest football memory earliest football memory oh um i will have been about nine years old and my idols back then were eric Cantona and ryan giggs and i went to watch mc carrington um and eric Cantona spent about an hour and a half going for all the fans signing autographs and i got my photo taken with him and yeah that was an early memory and since meeting him that's what I wanted. I wanted to be a professional footballer. And um, from the age of four years old, when I got my first pair of football boots, my dream was to, you know, be a professional athlete and um, play in the Premier League. So, yeah, that was my earliest, earliest memory. Something that, you know, sticks in the memory bank, that's for sure. It'll be hard to top that for the rest of the podcast. But uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> following in Cantona's footsteps and playing in the Premier League is something which you exactly did. I mean, in fact, you managed to play and score in all five of the top divisions in England from the conference all the way to the Premier League. I mean, quite the meteoric rise, I'm sure you'd agree, Mark. Was it as big as a roller coaster of a journey as it seems? Yeah, it was a real roller coaster. I mean, I, I got released twice, told I wasn't good enough at the age of 18 and 22. Um, when I was 18 in that season, I scored 27 goals in 14 games in reserve and youth team football. And I thought I was worthy of a contract, but um, told I wasn't good enough. But that is probably the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, it stood me in good stead. It made me the man I am today and helped me learn to deal with setbacks. I mean, setbacks are a big part of the game and um, it probably pushed me on. I wanted to prove people wrong who doubted me. And um, yeah, I got given different opportunities throughout my career. And as an athlete, you've got to take them opportunities. You've got to be obviously talented, but as I always say, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. And throughout my career, I've worked hard and um, that's a given. To make it to the top level, you've got to work hard. Yes, I'm sure you can appreciate obviously connecting the dots backwards now in hindsight. I mean, at that age, getting released at 18, 19, very much a case of most players going the other way and dropping out of the game, unfortunately. I mean, you've gone completely the other way and you've enjoyed such a remarkable career in the game. I mean, if I was to ask you, I mean, what were the secrets behind such a successful career in the game? I mean, the longevity alone. Yeah, obviously, I just touched on it. Hard work's massive. You've obviously got to have ability as well. But, I mean, from the age of... When I was 23, I signed for Hereford and that season I scored two goals against Bournemouth in the home fixture and one goal in the away fixture and they took a bit of a shine into me. Um, there was a scout watching me for six or seven games and I knew I needed to play well for that season because it was make or break. I'd just previously been released from Shrewsbury, told I wasn't good enough at 22. So I thought this season I've really got to kick on. I'm 23 years old now. And uh, I scored 13 goals um, and got like 12 assists that season. I got my move to Bournemouth and started to climb the leagues. Um, spent two years with Bournemouth in League One. And in our second season, we got promoted to the Championship. And that season, I thought the Championships, it's a different level. Um, people are more athletic. They can get up and down the pitch a lot better. No disrespect to League One, but... That's why the clubs were in the championship at the time. And I thought, how can I gain that extra edge to take my performance to the next level? And then I started to study and educate myself um, about nutrition, fueling for performance and recovery. And it took my performances to the next level. Spent two seasons in the championship and then we got promoted in our second season again to the Premier League um, and spent four amazing years, which, um, again, um, nutrition and taking care of what I was putting in my body made a huge difference to me personally. And obviously you explored the nutrition avenue, but in terms of, you know, taking pride, taking accountability for your own performance, doing that extra work, that extra research, I mean, would that not be the status quo 
for a footballer in the EFL or the Championship or the Premier League at the time? Yeah, I mean, you'd think so. I mean, but everything's put on a plate, like especially Championship, Premier League. You get all your food, um, you know, out for you in the mornings. You've got beautiful breakfast. You've got like chicken, turkey, at Bournemouth we had anyway, scrambled egg, avocado, smoothies, omelettes from the chef, whatever you want. But you'll be very surprised a lot of athletes do tend to choose the bad option. I've played with players that um, like a slice of white toast with jam, butter, and a hot chocolate, and they'll dip it in the hot chocolate. I won't name names, but, I mean, you've got all that beautiful food to fuel your performance. And, um, again, they just go for the sweet option, some people. But um, we all have to make decisions. And as I always say, improving the small percentages on a daily basis, whether it's your nutrition, your gym work, um, your extras after training, it all adds up. And like you just mentioned there, accountability is massive. And in order to get to the top, yeah, it's not easy, but that's one of the easiest things to do. It's staying there that's the hardest thing. You know, you want to get there, but to stay there, you've got to be consistent. You've got to do everything in your power to um, reach optimum performance and tick all the boxes. And when did you first experience from evidence, playing evidence perhaps, Mark, that having this differential mindset of the percentages could actually separate yourself from the pack? Yeah, so I spent a lot of times in the lower leagues up until the age of 25. I think it was 25, 26 when I got promoted to the championship with Bournemouth. And I was getting to about 70 minutes and I was feeling a little bit tired. Not, I, felt, I didn't feel like I could push on for that last 20 minutes. So I was thinking there's a reason why, there really is a reason why. And I felt like I was doing everything well. But I mean, when in my younger days, I'd celebrate with a good performance, with a win, and have a Chinese, a takeaway, whatever it may be. And looking back, that was detrimental towards my recovery because we played Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday. And I was getting to, you know, after the game on Saturday, really tired, fueling wrongly. And then on Sunday, I was even more tired. And then back in training on Monday, I still had that build-up of inflammation and I wasn't recovering properly. And that is probably why I spent a lot more time in the lower leagues than I envisioned because um, my recovery wasn't good enough. And back then I was doing about 11K in most games, like max. But once I started getting it right, once I started ticking all the boxes, I, um, I was doing 13, 14K in games and I was doing that consistently and I felt great doing it. It was quite hard to believe. I mean, doing research for this podcast, listening to you on a different podcast. I mean, you said you felt better at the age of 34 than you, than you did at the age of 22. It's just astounding. Yeah, I mean, as you get older, you've got to look after yourself more. But the only thing I look back on and I'm like, well, this is why I like educating the younger generation to do it from a younger age because the longevity um, of your career will just you know, be next level, really. Um, I feel, like I say, I feel great now. I probably feel in the best condition I've ever been in. Um, I'm playing five-a-side three times a week, you know, badminton, tennis, whatever it may be, doing gym, um, playing charity games. And I feel real physically in great shape. But the reality is in football, once you get to a certain age, um, then, you know, you get forgotten about, you know, you hit 30, 29, 30 these days and you're considered old um, and football is evolving. They want to bring the younger generation through. And, you know, I lost out on a contract at QPR um, by, you know, one game, a minute effectively um, due to COVID. And I believe everything happens for a reason. And that was my push to, you know, do something else with my life. I was in a good place. And I wanted to, you know, educate others on becoming the healthiest version of themselves. So, yeah, it's, it's been quite quite a roller coaster, but something I've, I've loved uh, every minute of. To have the awareness alone, Mark, you have to realise too, right, that's a competitive advantage. Because whenever I speak about footballers, speak footballers, current footballers, next footballers speak about habits and routines, I often question, is it really their own? Or is it something which they've adopted from the club and from the standards in that culture and that environment? 
can you see why some footballers may in fact struggle to transition with that element and taking ownership and accountability of their own routine their own processes yeah i mean accountability and routines everything i bang on about routine all the time and for the last 10 10 years i try to go to bed at a similar time every day um i try and get up at a similar time sometimes we veer off don't get me wrong due to various reasons if you have a meal out with family and you go to bed a little bit later but making sure you get the proper rest making sure you set yourself daily goals um is really important every night before i go to bed i write down what i want to achieve the next day i've done it for you know as long as i can remember now it's really important because as i always say dream big because anything's possible i was a million miles away um you know when i was getting released from clubs and um you know having that right routine taking your nutrition seriously um your recovery whether it's you know doing your gym work your yoga your core your ice baths um it really does all add up and if you're improving you know one percent over an 11 month season it's 11 percent you know if you're improving a percent every month and it's a massive difference. It really is. And I mean, without this enlightenment, you could say, is it ludicrous to suggest, Mark, that you would not become a Premier League footballer? Yeah, 100%. I mean, you, I've, I've played with a lot of talented footballers who were more talented than me. And, you know, we'd get to the Premier League and they'd, you know, they'd start to decline um, just because of the intensity of the game just because of the willingness not to want to learn and improve. Don't get me wrong, 90, 95% of the players who I played with, uh, you know, they came from the lower leagues with me, especially that Bournemouth team. We got through to the Premier League and we wanted to work hard for each other. We wanted to, we ran through brick walls because we'd never been there. We'd never um, been at that level before. So we knew how hard we'd worked. So we wanted to stay there for as long as possible. I think that really did help. But I think, um, not everyone, but certain individuals, when they're at that top level, when they start in an academy, and that's all they've known, maybe you can take it for granted and, you know, just take your foot off the gas. I don't know. Um, but I know for a fact, if you get that opportunity, I think the statistics are 0.5% of, of uh, footballers who come through the academies make it. So... I always say to young lads, why not be that number? Why not make that you? And educate yourself, do everything in your power to make it happen. Yeah, and often with these things, it's either a problem or a solution in terms of you either have the issues I is either or. It's identifying the problem or executing upon the solution. And it's amazing that once the player understands that small changes lead to huge and big results over time, why the hell is the follow through so low? I mean, does it take a born that type of born rate environment to be the biggest determinant in success? Yeah, I mean, you, you've hit the nail right on the head. Um, it's it's so important because following through with things and like doing everything in your power to be successful is a given. Once you're in that environment, once you get given that opportunity, every training session is really important because you never know who's watching you. Um, doing the small things, um, they do add up. And like in life, we we get given opportunities. You know, they're there all the time. It's we've got to make the most of them. We really have. And there's a lot of people in the game who have played with that haven't been as talented as someone else, but they didn't have to work hard. They really did, and they did all the small things right. I mean, for instance, I. <laughs> I had the pleasure of playing with, there's too many to name, but Jermaine Defoe. Um, I always highlight Jermaine because he's the ultimate profession. Um, 30, I think he was 36 at the time when I was playing with him, 35, 36. And he was still in peak condition because he looked after his nutrition. Um, you know, goal scoring record speaks for itself, but at 35, he was staying behind doing extras in training. And, you know, he was making sure he knew um, he was ready for the next game, no matter what. So people like that, you know, you look at their careers and you can learn from. If you look at it in the long term, it's always 
like it's that X, Y curve axis where the graph is going that way in terms of the players view their job. In fact, not as a job, but as a craft compared to those that are just doing it for the money. Like it, it must be absolutely insane to see how the incremental marginal gains work over time. But I mean, what you're doing in the current day, Mark, could you enlighten people? Because I know you're involved in doing a series of workshops. You're doing some stuff with the PFA. Seen you most recently doing some stuff with the guys at Bournemouth and Barnsley. Seems really interesting stuff. Yeah, I'm absolutely loving it. I'm I, I'm enjoying adding value in people's lives. I'm, um, like you just said there, enjoy what you do. I think that's so important. With every job, you've got to enjoy what you do. And I was really fortunate that I had another passion, something I was obsessed with outside of football. So I transitioned pretty well. I know a lot of my friends who were still in the game, they're worried about coming out of it because, you know, they don't know what's next. So, yeah, now at the moment, I'm, you know, I'm a health coach and I work with clients one-on-one -on -one, um, from athletes to 50-year-old men and women and everything else in between, which I absolutely love. I've had some amazing results so far and it's just the joy that, you know, it brings them, just whether it's losing weight, whether it's gaining lean muscle mass, improving athletic performance. Um, I just love seeing results with them. And, yeah, I'm on the, the life skills program as well um, for all 72 EFL clubs over here in England. So what I do, I go and deliver presentations for them and we do practical sessions in the kitchen um so yeah got lots more booked in i'm really looking forward to going meeting as many athletes as i can and adding value and helping them improve the small percentages that we speak about so um yeah got various other things going on as well um i'm in the process of developing my own website which um shouldn't be too far away now which i'm really excited about it'll give give a lot of uh, recipes for people to whether they want to just live a healthy lifestyle um, pre post match meals, healthy snacks, uh, food for recovery, and then just a lot more about myself as well. So, yeah, and uh, yeah, I've got lots more things that I want to do. I mean, like I say, just keep setting goals. Keep, um, you know, since I finished football, I always say to myself, I'm big on positive affirmations. I want to be more successful than I was in football. I've, I've a lot of, lot of work to do yet, but you know, why not? How clear is that goal setting? So, I mean, you can set yourself short, medium and long-term goals. And like, you know, my short-term goals, are I wanted to you know, develop a website. I wanted to, in the next few months, set up a YouTube channel that's going to, whether it be helping ha athletes, whether it be helping people who just want to live a healthy lifestyle, um, you know, cooking tutorials, that kind of thing. Um, fitness videos um, and then you know your medium and, and long-term goals um, I've obviously got loads in mind probably too many to talk so you've got to keep setting yourself goals and it's got to be consistent otherwise what's the point in standing still we've we've got to be cons consistently growing and improving as individuals and um, you know, what what's the point in in life if you're not pushing yourself and, and trying to achieve that next thing. And I mean, as you can tell, I mean, just through the engagement with your Instagram alone, I mean, there's huge demand for it out and not only the football public, but the whole public, so to speak. I mean, did that engagement knock you for six originally when you started repurposing yourself to being the foodie footler, putting up um, how to make, you know, protein pancake recipes and the likes? Yeah, I just set it up um, to try and encourage people at first and it, it got a real good response. And I always try and get that back to every message. Um, I think it's really important to engage with people. And, you know, I do value every message I get sent and I don't take it for granted. So I think that's really important. And, yeah, I obviously, you've got to expect it to take off and you've got to expect good things to come to you. And I'm really confident and I have self-belief. But, I mean, it was just something I, I was passionate about at the time. I was still playing football. I didn't have as much time as I do to do my cooking to, to get around different clubs now. Um, and, yeah, I'm, I'm looking to take it to the next level when I'm, I'm building house at the moment. So when I move into that, I get my new kitchen and 
I've got my nice setup. I, I want to take it to the next level. Um, so yeah, I've got lots of good ideas in the pipeline and uh, yeah, lots of exciting things to come. Fantastic. And then for example, just take us perhaps inside a Mark Cube workshop. I mean, pro probably know about the watts and, and the watts and the bolts, but I mean, how do you ensure follow through in your own respective environment? Is that a workshops for clubs or? Yeah, uh, just workshops for clubs. Yeah, so obviously the presentation will be 40 minutes long and then there'll be Q&As at the end. The The presentation will basically be, um, I'll help them with minus one game day fueling, game day fueling, you know, I'll speak a lot about the right carbs, for including your diet, protein, fats, small percentages to gain an edge, um, living a healthy lifestyle. So there's a lot that goes into that. And then obviously for, for the clubs that, have adequate kitchen facilities um, with, you know, I, I get the lads in the kitchen and we do like a little cook off. I'll, I'll demonstrate on, for instance, how to do healthy pancakes or salmon, and then they'll go get themselves into teams and then we'll, we'll judge the best team who, who does the, you know, the, the most pleasant dish, pleasing on the eye and obviously well cooked as well. So it's a bit of interaction. It's, um, it's getting them to step out of their comfort zone and do something they're not quite used to because a lot of the lads, especially from the age of 16 to 19, they're either in digs or the parents cook for them. So it's good for them to, you know, do it themselves and, and learn from a young age. And not obviously knowing any of your clientele at the moment, but I mean, hypothetically speaking, if we were to say you were having a top flight player now with a World Cup on the horizon in eight weeks and a jam packed uh, fixture schedule before then, Mark, I mean, what advice would you have for them? Yeah, I mean, it's it's all about fueling. I've I've worked with a lot of athletes who under eat, and we really have got to consume, you know, a lot of calories because the reality is, in a session, an intense session, you can burn up to fifteen hundred calories, sometimes more. So, making sure you fuel, but put the right fuel in because you want to get that balance right as an athlete, not to gain uh, body fat for the sake of you know, it, it, including loads of pasta, bread, white pasta, white bread, white rice, they can be detrimental sometimes towards your body fat and your recovery. So mixing that up and including a lot more complex carbs into your diet um, to help aid recovery and give you long sustained energy, in my opinion, is the way forward. But again, it changes on a day-to-day -day basis because on lighter days, for instance, me as an athlete, um, if I had a game Saturday to Saturday, I'd keep my carbs relatively low from Monday to Wednesday, and then I'd slowly start to int introduce more carbs Thursday, Friday, because if your body gets used to just carb, 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 carbs, carbs as an athlete, then it won't know how to use them effectively and efficiently when you come into that game day. So it's important to keep your metabolism guessing and keep mixing it up. Um, and as I say, every individual is different. It's not a one suit fits all approach. And getting to know your body as an athlete is key. You speak about under eating. Um, recently enough, you did a vlog, if I'm not mistaken, with ESPN and was over the average daily diet of a Premier League footballer. I mean, were you surprised by some of the reactions, some of the comments on that video? Because I remember you put out a reaction video to it then as well, explaining the, the thesis behind it. Yeah, I mean, there's always going to be um, people who agree with it, people who don't. Um, but at the end of the day, it's getting that balance. With all them meals I was consuming, I didn't feel bloated. Um, some days I burn, I, for instance, this week, um, I some days I do gym, play football in the evening, and I burn up to 2,000 calories. So the reality is I need to be eating close to 4,000 calories because my BMR, basal metabolic rate, is about 1,800. So I want to get above that basal metabolic rate, but I need to replenish my glycogen stores because I burnt 2,000 calories. That might go above some people's heads, but the reality is for maintenance and for me not to lose too much weight, for me not to gain too much muscle mass, I know what my body needs. And I don't need to count calories personally now because... I kind of know what's in most meals. Um, 
and literally I've just gone for maintenance for the past eight, nine years and it's, it's worked really well for me. Um, I'm always between 80 kilograms and 82 kilograms and I've never veered away from it. So yes, yeah, it's, it's worked really well for me, but like, like you mentioned there, you do get comments and um, it is quite a lot of food for a lot of people to consume. But when you are working that hard, it is really important. Um, a couple of a couple of athletes who have worked with in the past, when I set them a meal plan, they're like, well, that's a lot of food. And then I'm like, well, if it's too much food, just put the portion on your plate and stop eating when you're full, but your body will get used to it. Um, and within time, within three, four or five weeks, the athletes have been getting more hungry because they're eating the right things. If you're eating pointless calories, pointless carbs, then that's where you feel bloated and you feel lethargic. But if you're eating the right foods like whole foods um, and lots of high quality protein, then it'll it'll be the perfect balance, I'm sure. And would you reckon would you recommend a more calorie counting procedure or would you leave it at the individual's intuition? Yeah, it's all based on the individual, to be honest. I always try and hit my protein requirements. Um, I just go off, to be honest. It's give or take, really, with protein. I go chicken breast is anywhere between 25 and 30 grams of protein, depending on the size of it. Salmon, similar, whatever your protein source is. So I always encourage people to base the plates around healthy protein source, complex carbs, fruit, vegetables, um, a small amount of whole grains, and then some healthy fats as well. Um, it's a lot more calorie dense. Um, and like I mentioned, I don't, I don't work off calories, but if people want to lose weight or, you know, they need to be in a calorie deficit. If you want to gain lean muscle mass, if you want put, put weight on, you need to be in a calorie surplus. But if you want to maintain, you've just got to be sort of wary of, of where you're at at all times. So yeah, it's, it's really interesting because there's so many mixed opinions on it. Um, the guidelines out there, are, you know, I mean, a lot of it's false and I don't agree with a lot of it. But again, that's just my opinion. Some people might not agree with my opinion. So that's why I find nutrition such an interesting topic. And I guarantee you for a lifelong learner such as yourself, the education never stops. Never stops, no, because there's all sorts of new things coming out. I mean, they've just recently started saying that wheat's horrendous for the body and, you know, because of the farming process. And, yeah, there's all sorts of different things coming out and, you know, people have intolerances that they're not aware of. I know a lot of athletes that are intolerant to gluten and dairy as well. So it's, you know, where do you get your carbs and, and that from? It's, it's important to, to know your body and, like like you just mentioned, it's it's important that we don't just get um, you know, fixed on one approach because it's um, we need to. I'm not always right. I I hold my hands up sometimes. You know, I might say something wrong that's not helped one of my clients. So then we'll we'll adapt it. We'll progress. We'll change things up, um, and just get the best out of them. So I mean, no nutritionist in the world knows everything. So it's just uh, it's just giving the right advice that you feel is going to help someone. And in the years since you've taken an average, I suppose, interest and introspection in nutrition, Mark, I mean, what has been the one biggest belief you've in fact changed your mind about? So when I was when we just got promoted to the championship, um, my wife became intolerant, uh, really bad actually, from gluten and dairy. Um, so I limited them in my diet. The only dairy I consume is um, natural yogurt, a good quality one, which uh, has um, good bacteria in. Um, and since cutting dairy and gluten out, um, I dropped six percent body fat, and I felt so much better. I was I was always always in around like eleven, twelve percent, and I wanted to get down to in around six. And I've been at that for the last eight years now, and you know, I feel feel fantastic for it. Some people perform better with higher body fat, but I mean that was a game changer for me. Just not drinking cow's milk. This might not work for everyone again. Um, and I stayed away from uh, white rice, white pasta, white bread as much as possible. And I didn't feel as bloated. I felt 
I felt so good going into games rather than having pasta before games. I was having like things like quinoa, sweet potato, oats, um, switching my bread for, for sourdough bread, sourdough brown bread with peanut butter, honey, just making small changes. Like we said, the small changes really add up and uh, create big results in my eyes. I take it then the Guinness is off the cards. <laughs> the Guinness is like having a roast dinner. <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, you know what? Lots of iron in Guinness, so. Um, so <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm not a big Guinness fan, to be honest. When I did have a Guinness back in the day, I used to have a, a touch of black currant in. Just yeah, that, to soften I, I, it. To be honest, I think that's an English thing. Yeah, the Guinness. <laughs> but no, um, yeah, yeah, you, you Irish lads love the Guinness, don't you? Served us well over countless generations. <laughs> I mean, Mark, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, you've obviously played such a vital role in this niche of football nutrition that, to be honest, prior to yourself and one or two others, it didn't really knew existed. I mean, where do you see it evolving over the next few years? Yeah, I think it's massive. I think, um, like I say, I'm going to shoot with the moon, uh, shoot to the moon for it, if that's the same. Um, but it's it's literally um, there's so many avenues to explore um, with nutrition, and people's opinions are always changing on it. I'll always stick to my beliefs. I believe that the whole food first approach is massive. Um, I teach the lads um, how to read food labels because I think marketing is absolutely horrendous um we look on the front of packages and because it's all you know all the greens low fat low sugar whatever it may be we think it's healthy but the reality is on the ingredients in the back there could be loads of sweeteners in um, which are detrimental towards the gut microbiome so i just want to keep educating people and um help the world become a healthier happier place obviously help athletes or help people whether it be lose weight, gain lean muscle mass, um, help with brain fog. I mean, it's happening everywhere. Uh, I did a corporate event the other day and you know, the majority of them people, they, they suffer with brain fog, a lethargicness around two, three o'clock in the afternoon. So it's all to do with hydration and fueling properly. So yeah, I want to, I want to take it as far as I can really. And, um, when I when I retired from football, one of the things I write down every day is like I want to change the world for the better. And uh, yeah, I'll keep I'll keep dreaming, keep dreaming. Yeah, I, I, I want to. That was going to be the next question. I want to link that. Um, I mean, upon researching this podcast, I came across one of the posts you did on LinkedIn quite recently, and I think it's vital for anyone who's transitioning out of an industry, not only footballers, to go through it. And it was you speaking about reflection. Obviously, it was a pivotal time of your life. You're deciding whether or not to continue with the game, which has served you so well throughout your career. But you opted to cash out, so to speak, and focus on the nutrition side of things. I mean, during that time, Mark, what did you learn about yourself? Yeah, I learned an awful lot. I learned that um, fa family is the most important thing to me. Um, my my youngest really struggled with me doing all the traveling, especially. Uh, when COVID was was around, because I was traveling from Bournemouth to Shrewsbury, and I was staying in Shrewsbury for like two, three weeks at a time, and I weren't seeing them for long periods. So, yeah, I, I learned that the, my family is the most important thing to me. Um, and then I just thought, you know, I'm I spent about about four or five months away from the game, and I was like, I've achieved everything I want in the game. Um, I'm really happy where I'm at. I'm in a good place. Um, I'm enjoying a little bit more flexibility in my life. And looking back, it was a good decision because my agent at the time, he said, you might regret it. You know, a lot of people regret coming out of the game early. Um, <clears throat> I spoke to Eddie Howe and he said, you're too good to retire. And, but the reality is I'd have probably been tempted if another championship club or a Premier League club came in for me. But once you've spent that time at the top and you start to come down the leagues because of your age, whatever it may be, um, it doesn't become as, um, it doesn't give you that buzz. 
Um, and with with no fans being in the stadium again, I was reflecting back. Football is just not the same without the fans. And that probably made it easier as well because my last game I played, there was no fans in the stadium. So it didn't have that feel it used to for me. Um, and I always said after football, I wanted to be health cl- a health coach. Um, and I could have prolonged it for five, six years quite easily because I was physically in good shape. But again, if you don't take that jump, change is always good sometimes. And I wanted to step out of my comfort zone because I knew I was, I could have easily, you know, got a club. I had a couple of offers um, back in that summer and it was a big decision to to hang my boots up, but one that I'm really happy with. I think it's a vital and powerful message to send out in the football community that you, in fact, you know, can have your whole cake and eat it. Because for so long, I mean, it's that idea that we're brought up upon that you have to sacrifice, you have to grit, you have to grind, which I do agree with to a point, but not at the behest of the most important things in life, which you certainly come to understand and, you know, spread out that message. So kudos to yourself. But I mean, as we begin to close this podcast, Mark, I mean, it's been thoroughly insightful for myself. I took a lot away from it. But I mean, if we were to revert back to the very start of your footballing journey, and what advice would you have for a young Mark Pugh? Um, good question. Yeah, very really good question. So educate yourself, um, focus on your recovery more. Um, there were so many things I'd say to myself, to be honest, but yeah, I mean, I was always really good. I wasn't one to go out. I, I met my wife really young. Um, a lot of lads like a night out, but I was really, um, dedicated. I wanted it a lot, but again, the education side of things, uh, fueling for performance, fueling for recovery. Um, you know, small things I could have done um, to maybe climb the leagues a little bit quicker than I did because there was obviously something stopping me. I got there in the end and it was a journey, but I had undoubted talent from a young age. Um, I had the work ethic, but there was something stopping me. And whether it be right, the right timing, the right person watching me, I don't know. But yeah, the, the main thing is just educate yourself again on the you know things to improve your performance. Are you happy that you embarked upon that journey? I certainly am. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's the best thing I ever did, and and I encourage anyone to do it. Uh, you know, like I say, I did an eighteen module course, which you know covered a lot of topics regarding nutrition the biomechanics of the body. Um, I got to learn my, I got to learn and know a lot more about my body and what it needed. Um, don't get me wrong, I wasn't perfect. I still like the odd uh, naughty treat if you know you go for a pub lunch with a family and you fancy a sticky toffee pudding and custard, you know, so be it. But I was 90% good, 10%, you know, if, if, if you want a treat, then have a treat but it meant everything to me and if something means everything to you then you go above and beyond and that's what I wanted especially when I got released twice I was on my honeymoon when I got released the second time so the the wife was obviously like, oh we need to pay off the wedding we need to do this we need to do that and I just said to her I remember saying it to her like don't worry I'll play in the Premier League and I was putting it out there I always had belief in myself and I wanted to make that happen. So, yeah, um, I'd encourage any young player that's whether they've dealt with a setback, whether they're in a good place at the minute to just always surround yourself with positive people. Um, you know, positive self-talk's massive and never stop believing. Having a Guinness once in a while won't, <laughs> won't hurt to. <too>. Mark? <laughs> <laughs> Mark, it's been an absolute pr- uh, pleasure having you on and all the best with your continued success. Thank you, mate. Same to you, mate. I wish you all the best for your uh, new Canadian journey. <laughs>